Hello, Trap Set listeners. Today, a conversation with the phenomenal Mary Lattimore, who incidentally will be part of my new band, Night Creatures, for our show on November 21st at Hollywood Forever. The band also features Matt Cameron on drums, Mary Timoney on guitar, Chad Moulter on bass, Chrysanta Baker on keyboards, and a 12-piece chamber orchestra. There's still a few tickets left, so go to my website, joewong.org, for details. Hope to see you there. Just say yes to all of the experiences, just because it all adds to your, you know, it's like a collage. It's like a, it all adds to your palette of what you can do and your tools that you have. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the Trap Set. I want to play something for you. You're hearing Quintana by my guest, Mary Lattimore. A native of Asheville, North Carolina, Mary deploys classical harp technique to construct vivid and immersive improvisatory sound worlds. As a hired gun, Mary has worked with artists such as Thurston Moore, Kurt Vile, Sharon Van Etten, Jarvis Cocker, and The Clientele. She's also released several solo recordings, as well as duo albums with artists like Mac McCon and Meg Baird. A relentless road warrior, Mary spent 215 days of the last year on tour. I spoke to her during a rare break in Pasadena, California. And now my conversation with Mary Lattimore. One of my earliest memories is falling out of my parents' moving car <laughs> when I was I was going. My we lived in a cabin in Asheville when I first, you know, growing up, maybe ages like um, zero to three. I guess we lived in this little cabin at the top of a mountain. My parents had this pickup truck, and I just remember like le- I was in the you know, in the passenger seat with my dad. And I just remember like leaning against the door because I was sleepy or something. And all of a sudden the door flew open and I was dangling down by my seatbelt, like on this, on our gravel road going down. And my dad, of course, was flipping out, but it was really scary. So that was my first memory. (laughs) One of them. You know, I ask lots of people that question (laughs) and often it's a traumatic memory. I guess trauma (laughs) burns into our brain more than pleasure. (laughs) <laughs> Sometimes. I guess so. And I also, it's also taught me to, you know, whenever I take a nap against the door of a car, I always have to make sure that the door is locked. <laughs> That's a good lesson to learn early on. <laughs> but mm-hmm. n- most cars have uh, child locks in the back now. I guess that's why. Yeah, totally. It could have gone a lot worse, I suppose. Definitely. I could have had my little face shredded on a gravel driveway. <laughs> I have a memory like that. I was in my mom's car my mom had a beige Cadillac in the 80s, <laughs> and I was in the front seat, and I didn't have my seatbelt on, and she had to make a sudden stop, and I flew forward and hit the dash. Oh, man. And she was like, that's so stupid that you didn't have your seatbelt on. <laughs> she was pissed. Mm-hmm. I, I must have been around, around about 1984, I'm thinking. Yep. It's around the same time as I had my... What did your parents do? For a job or when I almost fell out of the car? No. For, what, what, did the, what was their occupation? <laughs> um, my mom is a harpist. She still is one, professional harpist. And my dad, at that time, our family had this business. It was named Three Mountaineers, and it was a furniture business based in Asheville, and it had been in my family for some generations. And my dad was the personnel manager at the plant. So, um, yeah, that's what he did at the time. What kind of music was on in your house? 
you know, a lot of what we call classic rock now, I guess, like kind of Southern, Southern style classic rock too. Like my parents listened to, let's see, they really liked Willie, or they really like Willie Nelson, Dolly Parton, um, Bruce Springsteen, Nitty Gritty, Dirt Band, stuff like that. My mom, of course, played a lot of classical music in her house too, especially music that featured the harp because she was playing with the Asheville Symphony Orchestra and she did that since she was like 25 years old. So, And she, she's still with that orchestra? She just retired last year, wow. but she was with them the whole time, you know? So she plays, she still um, substitutes for in a lot of orchestras around the area, like in North and South Carolina and Tennessee and stuff. So she's still a pretty active harpist. Did she practice a lot when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. And she still practices a lot. Did you get the sense that she was getting a lot of joy out of playing harp at the time? Or was it more like a job? Because lots of classical musicians that I know are almost like tradespeople, where it's Mm -hmm. like this is what I do. I go to work and I, you know, hone my craft, but it seems like they're not as joyful about it as other musicians. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, my mom definitely is very joyful about the harp. She, she's in love with it. You know, like she definitely, um, she loves to practice. She loves to get better at the part and she definitely, she chose it for herself. So when she was a child, she had a next door neighbor, who was a teenager who played the harp. And so she just, she loved it as a child and, you know, begged her parents to play. So uh, it wasn't something like, for me, I was kind of not forced to learn how to play the harp, but definitely it was expected of me to try to learn how to play it. But with her, it was just like the sound and the the beauty of the instrument that really called to her. I would say uh, she definitely still loves it you know right now she definitely has a lot of harpist friends and leads harp ensembles and she has tons and tons of harp students and it's just her whole you know it's such a it's such a part of her but also she's very critical of herself if she messes up during a solo or something with the orchestra and she'll you know that's one thing that we're we're different in is she'll really analyze and overanalyze the mistakes after she's already completed the performance. And for me, it's like, if I mess it up, then I never want to think about it ever again. You know, I'm like, it's, it's already gone. Like it's already passed, but she just wants to kind of rehash it over and over again. But I think it it all comes out of a, a total love for the instrument and for the music and the beauty of the music and, and for the fun of playing. Do you believe that there's such thing as a mistake in Me? music? Um, yeah, I mean I I guess like having grown up in a, the classical training world, there are definitely mistakes like when you don't put the F pedal into the sharp position or something, <laughs> you know? Like you want to be true to what's written when you're playing a solo or cadenza or whatever, you want to like be true to the intention of the composer. For me, I I can't really make mistakes with my music, which is which is pretty awesome. But I do believe that there are mistakes, you know. Right, depending on the intention. Uh huh. So why can't you make mistakes with your music? I just do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I write it. So I just there aren't really any rules. I I like that idea of having happy accidents, sort of in there and like there's there's a little bit of risk and it's kind of structured improvisations but really it can go anywhere just depending on my mood and yeah just no rules earlier you said that it was kind of expected of you that you would play harp and i think you told me that you started playing when you were around 12 yeah 11 11 Mm -hmm. yeah why did you feel like it was expected of you like was it expected of you to take over your family business too or was it more expected of you to follow after your mom I think to follow after my mom, I think her enthusiasm for it was just kind of spilling over into her, you know, her motherhood. And she wanted to see if I could, if I had a knack for it. And I think I probably did early on. I, I started playing the piano when I was five. And so 
from there, it was kind of a natural thing to like, let Mary try out the harp. And she didn't do that with my sister or my brother, but she's her first grandchild. My sister's daughter, Caroline, has a little tiny harp and my mom gives her lessons. And That's really so cute. It's, yeah, it's really cute. Teeny. Are, are teeny. your siblings older or younger? They're both younger. Okay. Yeah. So you were the oldest and maybe that's why she mm-hmm. wanted you to play? Yep. Can you remember how it felt to play the harp like before you officially started playing I, I assume that you were you touched your mom's ha- harp mm-hmm. and got a chance to just mess around a little bit can you remember what the feeling you associated it, with the with the instrument was I can't really remember no I mean I definitely touched it but I um yeah, I don't really remember and I I don't really remember learning it initially so well like learning the layout of it and the I mean it just feels like it I guess I'm getting old (laughs) it just feels like it's it's been there you know I also think my mom my mom was pregnant when uh you know she was pregnant with me and she was learning this really hard hard parts like a legendarily hard piece called Zagan and it has a huge harp harp part that's very very difficult and so she she took me to our we have another cabin we have like a few little tiny cabins in North Carolina and this is one that my parents bought when they were newlyweds so she took the harp up there to learn this really hard part and I was in her her belly you know and so I feel like I was having the harp resting <laughs> On the belly, like the pregnant belly, when you're focusing really hard on learning this part, I guess I was feeling all the vibrations. I like to think about that, you know, like it's kind of, I was kind of absorbing it as in the womb. (laughs) I don't know if that's real, but I kind of think about that sometimes. You think you absorbed the the learning (laughs) part of it, like this frustration of learning it and the beauty of accomplishment? (laughs) 100%. And also just the vibrations of the harp, so... It was kind of familiar to me already. Maybe no wonder you're so well adjusted and (laughs) (laughs) smart. (laughs) It's like baby Mozart, but better. (laughs) Baby Mozart. When did you start identifying as a harpist? I guess maybe in high school when I started to get more serious about it. I started to go to music camps in the summer and hang out and make you know friends at the music camps and. It was really fun socially at the same time as it was really educational musically. And so then I I started to see it as being something pretty special. And yeah, I, I was a harpist in my high school orchestra too, and then went on to music conservatory and stuff. So yeah, the more I the more I practiced and the more I got serious about it, then the more I thought, like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing rather than something like my mom was making me do. <laughs> That's a powerful feeling mm-hmm. when it becomes kind of part of your identity. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I, when, when I had that realization about being a drummer, it felt like I was becoming an adult. <laughs> when was that? Probably when I was 12, when I first started playing with other musicians. Mm-hmm. You're like, I'm a drummer. This, I was like, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That's <laughs> it really was cool. like my version of a, you know, rite of passage. Cause mm-hmm. My family was atheist, so I didn't have a bar mitzvah or a, <laughs> or a confirmation or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Was your family religious? Yeah, my family's still pretty religious. But in um, you know, an open-minded kind of way, like they're, they're Methodist and they're progressive people and they're like very you know they like the community of the church and stuff so where did you go to college i went to the eastman school of music in rochester, in rochester. Mm-hmm. when did you go there 98 through 2002 oh, we're exactly the same age are we so you were born in 80 yep yeah me too oh cool um you're just a little bit younger than me because you just had your birthday and yeah. mine was earlier in the summer mm-hmm. but same grade same grade <laughs> Class of 98 in high school. Yep. Um, I'm trying to think about who else was on this show that graduated Eastman at the same time, but I'll think of it later. I know some some people that have been on this show graduated long ago. Like Mm -hmm. um, the probably the most famous drummer on this show is a guy named Steve Gadd, who's a studio drumming legend, and Mm -hmm. he went to Eastman back in the 60s, early 70s, maybe. 
Wonder, anyway, he's from Rochester. Wonder what Rochester was like back then. He, well, he told me it was it was booming. Really? You know, it was, oh, well. While Kodak was still doing really well, and before long before digital photography, and there were all sorts of businesses there, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a booming middle class enclave. What wow. was it like when you were there? I mean, Kodak was not doing well. Xerox was, I think it was closing at that point. So yeah, I don't know. That was that was the first time I'd been. I I chose Eastman partly because I wanted to get out of North Carolina and I wanted to see, you know, be in a bigger city or something. So I definitely thought Rochester was closer to New York City than it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I saw like real poverty for the first time there and like economic depression and, you know, had the fear of getting mugged on the way to the ATM, you know, stuff like that. There was crime there, but I grew to really love Rochester. My, um, my senior year of college, I started working at a couple of record stores in Rochester. So, you know, I had friends outside of Eastman, which was, it really opened up my world and made some really great friends. And, um, it was kind of a, a smaller city, it, so easier to get to know, you know, coming from... I went to high school in Shelby, North Carolina, which was a tiny little town. So going from Shelby to Rochester felt like, um, you know, it was a little bit easier than going from Shelby to L.A. or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I liked Eastman a lot. It was... I had studied abroad for a year, so I was in only high there, school? In or, college. Oh, in college. So yeah. I was only there for three years, but it was cool. Had you kind of developed your own aesthetic when it came to music by the time you got to college? Uh, as far as listening goes, I I listened to a lot of different kinds of music, but I didn't play a lot of different kinds of music. Like I definitely just stuck to the classical pieces that I was assigned and, um, you know, in, in college I spent a lot of time in the practice room just learning and learning these beautiful classical uh, works, but I didn't really play anything that wasn't written down. Mm-hmm. Did you aspire to? Like, did you have a secret wish to want to play, want to bring harp into a different context as you've ultimately done? Not in college. I didn't think that I could. I so, just didn't have the confidence. So the record stores that you were working at, mm-hmm. what record stores were they? One was called Analog Shock, and it was great. It was a small record store. It was owned by a friend of mine, Justin Gellner, who's a really amazing guy. And he, I met him because I started working at the radio station at the University of Rochester. So I had my own radio show there. And then I was, Justin, Justin was the radio, was the, music director at that radio station. He was a student at the University of Rochester. So he asked me to be his assistant music director and then I then he left and I became the music director for a little bit there. And so he opened up a store called Analog Shock and it was great. It had there were shows there and it was just kind of like a little hub in South on I think it was called South Wedge in Rochester. And uh yeah, it was great. It was like a little community there, and he's a super charismatic person. So that was awesome. And then I also worked at this bigger record store called Fantastic Records, which is now closed, but it was in a strip mall, and it's kind of a you know Rochester institution. What are some of the artists that you got turned on to during those days of working at a record store that have become fundamental to your journey? I don't know. I I guess the first one that comes to mind is Steely Dan. <laughs> My friend Jason. Well, Steve Gadd, the drummer I was telling you about, played on Asia oh, and yeah. some other Steely Dan, and he's an Eastman alum. So nice. there you go. <laughs> okay. Full circle. <laughs> Full circle, yeah. My friend Jason. I I don't know, Steely Dan is one of those bands that you kinda of, you can kind of make fun of people for listening to when you're younger and you're like, oh, Steely Dan's for dads or whatever. But it sure is. Then but when so you, <laughs> then when you <laughs> Then when you really listen to it, it's so good. And I wonder if anyone has started a cover band called Steely Dad. Probably, right? <laughs> and it would just be a yeah. bunch of dads oh, covering Steely t- Dan. I can totally see it. <laughs> would be really good. Uh-huh. <laughs> Steely Dad. <laughs> Everybody would know exactly uh, what it is just from the yeah, name. It's a dad joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Uh-huh. So what what Steely Dan stuff turned you on? Like what was it? I mean, I like those pop, there's like poppier songs like on Pretzel Logic. Oh, like Berry Town and uh-huh. stuff. Berry oh, Town. so good. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. Can't buy a thrill. There's this one song called Any Major Dude. <laughs> yeah, that's on Pretzel Logic too. Uh-huh, that's that so one good. is so good. And Jason, my my really close friend working at the record store, he and I became super close. He's still one of my best friends. He put it on a mixtape for me, and I was like, oh, Steely Dan, you put it on a tape. Uh. But then I just started loving that that song, Any Major Dude. It was like, oh, I couldn't wait for that song to come on. So then I started listening to Steely Dan. I was like, okay. It was like inching into my life. So the first song <laughs> in the Steely Dad, the <laughs> first song that Steely Dad could play is, Any Major Dad with Half a Heart Surely Would Tell You, My Friend. There you go. You got it. I think, yeah, I don't know. It seems like... <laughs> seems like a million-dollar idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody's going to steal it from you. Those tribute bands are bigger than regular bands. Uh-huh. So there you go. I know. <laughs> I, if, would you want to play in a Steely Dan tribute band? Or if you had to start a tribute band, oh. what band would you tri- would you pay tribute to? Oh, interesting. I mean, as a harpist? I don't know. There's there are two harpists that I know from Eastman that have a, a project called Harp Talica. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's kind of it's kind of weird. I think there's a fine line between just like gimmicky with a harp, you know, like doing a cover band with a harp. I think it's it can get corny really fast. Not saying that Harp Talica is corny, but um, I'm I, not saying that Steely Dad <laughs> is corny. <laughs> <laughs> um. Steely like Dad is very serious, <laughs> but I don't know. I think I think there's a little bit of a danger in like cover covering things on the harp. You know, you don't want to make it too cartoony. But maybe I could play keyboard in yeah, a cover I'm, band. I'm, I'm just saying, like conceptually, <laughs> if you had to be in uh-huh. a, on any instrument, really, what what, oh, I don't, what what tribute band would you do? Well, that's a good question. What would you do? Well, at this point in my life, I might do a Kate Bush tribute band. Oh, you love her. I love her so much. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was a band band, mm-hmm. if it was a classic rock band, what would I do? Uh, maybe like Fairport Convention oh, tribute beautiful. band. Oh, beautiful. Oh, I would be in that. Yeah, I would 100% be in that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Actually, Fairport Convention would lend itself to a harp tribute mm-hmm. easy. Maybe a there would be like a... What kind of harps did they use in like... Renaissance England. There were certain like folk harps. That oh they yeah, used, those right? little folk harps. Yeah. Yeah, could I be cool. in a Brian Eno cover ba- yeah, hell tribute yeah. band? Of course you could. Beautiful. Um, all right. So, did you hang out at the Bug Jar a lot in oh, Rochester? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I actually spent. You know, my birthday is on September 11th, and that my 21st birthday was 9/11. Mm-hmm. But the night before 9/11. At the stroke of midnight, I was at the Bug Jar having my first official drink. What was the drink? <laughs> I think it was a white Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I went through a little white Russian phase there. Because um, of Big Lebowski no. or some other reason? I had just because of deliciousness. I yeah, think. that's pretty good, huh? <laughs> but yeah, September 10th, like I, I got to go into the Bug Jar for the first time as a 21 That's when I met my friend Jason, who worked with me at Fantastic. I met him there that night. And then the next day, like, the world changed, you know? It's pretty pretty wild. I remember I was in Boston, and I had dropped out of music school there. And I was set to fly home on September 11th out of the Boston airport, which is where some of the, I think, two of the flights took off from Boston. Damn. So I ended up. Staying for, I stayed on the East Coast for about an extra three weeks before wow. I could get back to Milwaukee. Wow. Yeah. Did you even go to the airport? No, I, I was on the phone with the airline that morning to confirm my flight. And as I was on the phone, they said, hold on, we all have to go to a special meeting. Like, you should turn on the TV. No a, way. A, a plane just hit the World <sighs> Trade Center. And then I turned on the TV and saw the second one hit in real time. I saw it too. My mom was like, don't turn on the TV. I don't want your birthday to be ruined. Don't turn it on. So of course I turned it on. <laughs> of Did course it I turned it on uh, for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely it was really heavy to see that second one like in, in real time, like unforgettable sadness. 
Yeah, and I remember it was just scary because there were like f- there were fighter jets flying over Boston, mm. and I was like, "What is that? And who is that?" Mm-hmm. Because they were we we weren't sure what was going on. There were there was talk of you know water supplies being poisoned or more oh, planes yeah. or different attacks on the ground. <sighs> It was scary. Yeah. I remember like watching Peter Jennings and like seeing the look in his eye and he didn't know what was to come like or what was going to happen and seeing like fear in the eyes of like broadcasters who are usually so measured, you know, it's kind of that that was super terrifying. Did you feel in college like the music that you were studying and the music that you were listening to at the record store were mutually exclusive worlds? Mm hmm. And what did your what were your ambitions? Did you want to become a concert musician like your mom? Yeah, I wanted to play in orchestra. Which orchestra did you want to play in? Any orchestra that would take me. I think I my thought was, you know, that that's like a steady job. Yeah. I definitely because of my mom, I saw I have always seen harp and having a music career as being like a a valid and realistic kind of job, which I think is it's kind of luxurious to see that, I think, and I, I don't take it for granted. It's def- and playing a harp, you know, I, my mom, she plays for funerals, she plays for weddings, she plays for, uh, you know, events and stuff. So she's a real hustler. So I've always seen it as like something that I can do if I just hustle, I can just do anything with it, you know? But back then I thought, playing in an orchestra would be really satisfying and um, and maybe glamorous, you know, like getting to go to different countries or getting to go to different places and play with a traveling orchestra. That was my idea of what I wanted to do. But then when it really came down to it, you know, like orchestras barely have harpists. Like if you, ha- if you get a job with an orchestra as a harpist, you keep that job until you're an old lady and you can't play anymore. You know, it's like rare that there's an opening. Interesting that you say old lady. because Old most, person. <laughs> well, but most professional harpists are women, right? I think in the U.S. they are. Yeah. But in Europe, I think it's a different story. It's funny because I started this show, as you know, and it was only about drummers. Mm-hmm. And lots of women have been on. And we were talking about how, for some reason, most drummers are men and yet there's nothing innately masculine about drums right and there's nothing innately feminine about harp Mm -hmm. uh yet our society kind of assigns a femininity to it perhaps yeah the founding fathers of all the modern harp techniques are both men you know they uh grangeny and salzado those are like the the two different modern styles of playing which style do you use? I learned the French technique, like the Grangeny technique. It's kind of divisive, you know, like, if you, or at least it was when I cared about that kind of thing. It was like I a, love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the, tr- the traditional versus matched grip debate mm-hmm. in drums or like <laughs> how when equal temperament mm-hmm. was developed, <laughs> how divisive that was. Mm-hmm. I love nerdy debates (laughs) and and the gusto with which people pursue them. Mm -hmm. So after college, what was your plan? Did you start auditioning? Mm-hmm. No. I, well, when I was in college, I, I kind of got burnt out on all the practicing and also like not having conversations with people that were doing other things other than classical music, you know? So I decided that I would study abroad my junior year, and I was one of two students that studied abroad. 
outside of Eastman and it was definitely not encouraged because when you go to a such a heavy school like that you're like supposed to study with a teacher that you've come there to learn from you know that specific teacher but I was like I, I gotta get out of here just for my own brain and I gotta like expand my my just my personality in in ways and so I just I went to Milan for a semester and I studied with the harpist from La Scala Luisa Prandina and I studied Italian and met met a whole bunch of people traveled around in Italy and then the second semester I studied in Vienna and Austria and I studied with the harpist from the symphony there and also just had like a great time just checking out Austria and getting to know it and then I came back to to Rochester for that final year and after I graduated from Eastman then I got a Fulbright to teach English in Vienna so I spent two years there teaching English are you fluent in German right now no (laughs) I definitely forgotten a lot but I mean I was okay I I lived there for a really long time, four years to- in total. So I was pretty pretty okay when I lived there. But then also I had a ton of friends who didn't really want to hear my bad German, and they just spoke English to me. Then. Yeah, right. That's what happens when I go over there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you speak German? Too? No, but but the reason is I've never lived in Germany or Austria, but when I've toured there, the tour manager always speaks English really, really well. Mm-hmm. And doesn't have the patience for me to <laughs> bungle the language. I know. It's like kind of a, th- a thing, too, when you want to get to know people and you want to like have a true, sincere conversation. You can't really do it in a language that you don't, you know, the vocabulary of, of true friendship isn't really there, you know? So their English was way better than my German. When you were teaching English, were you playing harp? Not very much. I uh, I used to go to a music store called Music House Berg, and it had a harp in the back room, and I would rent it by the hour just to practice and to keep it up. I also, um, yeah. So I didn't really I didn't really hang out with the harp very much for those two years. Well, when did you start improvising? But I started improvising not very long ago. You know, so first. My first um, show that I ever played, I became friends with the Arcade Fire when I went to go see them. Well, first, so I had an internship at Merge Records when I was in college because I'm from North Carolina. You know, I was, I was home for a summer, and and that was like the summer after sophomore year. I had an internship there, and I got to know Mac and Laura and hung out with all those guys. And then after... Vienna, I moved to Philadelphia. I was moving to Philadelphia and I went to Columbia, Missouri to visit a friend and this merge band Arcade Fire was playing there and I had never heard of them or anything, but I just wanted to support merge because I like them a lot. And so I started talking to them after their show and they were like, well, oh, you're moving to Philly in a few months. We're playing in Philly in a few months. Why don't you sit in with us and play the harp. And I was like, well, I never played harp with a band before. I never played anything besides classical music. And they were like, well, just try it out. There's already harp parts on the record. You can just learn those by ear and then just come up and sit in with us. And so I moved to Philly, and then that day came, and I I just did it. And I had so much fun. It was super um, – it was amazing. It was a sold out show, and they called me onto the stage, and I just played my little harp, and <laughs> it was super exciting. And then I was like, "Oh, this is what I want to do, but I want to learn how to write parts." And so then I started to actually like write parts for different bands in Philly, and and record those. And then I started. And imp- some of those bands have gone on to become yeah bigger. Notable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Kurt Vile was one of the first people that I ever played with, and he he trusted my ear. He trusted me to write a part for one of his or for a couple of his songs in the beginning. We've had this really great working relationship and wonderful friendship for years and years now. So that was really cool, and yeah, a lot of other different Philly musicians. And why did you choose to live in Philly? In Rochester, 
these two guys, I met these two guys, Greg Weeks and Otto Hauser, and they were in a, they uh, started a band called Espers, and they were based in Philly. So they moved from Rochester to Philly, and I went to visit them, and their house was so beautiful, and it's like a really great community. And so after Vienna, my visa ran out, and I knew that I had to move back to the U.S., and so I chose Philly just because of that. It was cheap. You know, music was happening there, and so. So your your way into improvising was writing parts. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah, and then through Kurt and some other situations, I got to know Thurston Moore, and he asked me to play on his um, Demolished Thoughts record with Samira Lebelski. So the three of us were going to fly to Malibu, and we were going to make the record with Beck. But before that, we wanted to kind of see how we all sounded together. And Thurston and Samara were super, of course, super like improvising masters. And I had never really done that before besides just writing parts and being really thoughtful about like composition sounds and like how the harp would fit in. I never really just like gone for it, you know? And so Thurston was like, okay, I want us to play a couple shows together just improvise shows just to hear how we sound before we make this record. And so he invited uh, Bill Nace to play with us too, who's like another another great friend and improviser. So the four of us did some shows and they really liked what I was doing. It was kind of scary actually. It was a little bit intimidating to play with those guys at first, but then they were really encouraging, and they were like, oh, you're doing a great job. Oh, that was sick. That was beautiful. And so I just felt really like, okay, if they're telling me I'm doing a good job, my instincts are okay at this. And then I just, now it's like mainly all that I do. Yeah, how would you describe the difference mentally when you're improvising versus writing, composing? Oh, I don't, I mean, my memory is pretty shot. (laughs) I feel like it's, it, the improvising is, it just lets me be free and not, not have to worry about playing the same thing over and over again, or having to remember exactly what I did that fit in there precisely like puzzle and, you know, get free with dynamics and all that stuff. And, and to really listen, like to really turn my ears on and, and be in the moment. Yeah, I love it so much. And right now, I i mean, at this point, I do a lot of collaboration. I do a lot of improvising yeah, lot. with different people. Yeah, I just say yes to all all of the experiences just because I want to, it all adds to your, you know, it's like a collage. It's like a, it all adds to your palette of what you can do and your tools that you have music-wise. So, yeah, I just say yes to it. And I don't have that fear anymore. I'm really glad. I think it comes with getting older, too, and having more experience under your belt. How's your confidence? It's great. Earlier you mentioned (laughs) that your your mom kind of is very self-critical when she makes mistakes, but what... How, what's your relationship to your own music? Like, if you hear yourself back on a record, Mm -hmm. how do you feel about it usually? Pretty happy. (laughs) I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, whoa, that doesn't, I can't even remember doing that. So it sounds like somebody else did it. Well, and I can kind of hear it objectively, which is pretty exciting too. Um, To, I don't know, I uh, definitely don't beat myself up as much as I did when I was playing classical music. So it's kind of a thrill to be free and to just do whatever I want. Do you think there's any value in beating yourself up as a musician? Yeah, <laughs> I guess. I guess, like, I I do, it is really fun, and you know this, it's fun to have a practice, mm-hmm. and it's fun to get better at something, and, like, to say, like, oh, this isn't working, and to be, not beating yourself up, but to just be, like, to be discerning and to be critical, it's mm-hmm. also, it's also important, you know, but but to just be, like, sitting in your tiny room, just, like, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. <laughs> like I, that feeling is really awful. So I always thought that that was necessary, mm-hmm. but it's not like military <laughs> or something. No, it's not. I think it took away the joy. Mm-hmm. And and at the time that I was feeling that way, 
I was like, well, if I can just get good, then uh-huh. I can, then I'll have the right to enjoy myself again. <laughs> yeah, wow. And that's messed up. Uh-huh. It is messed up. And some of the greatest musicians that I've talked to for this show have kind of disproven that mm-hmm. approach. Although plenty of them have gone through phases like that. Mm-hmm. I think it's natural to go through phases like that, but I don't think it's necessary, actually. Mm-hmm. It's probably constructive to a certain point, but... Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, when do you feel like you had your own voice as a musician? Uh, I guess back then, like when I was writing parts, when I started to write parts for, for people, you know, like I, because I listened to so much music that I didn't, um, wasn't something that I was playing, you know, just cause I love listening to music and records and all that stuff, you know, just different styles. I had really absorbed kind of like the the love of like a melody line or like a, a like love of different textures and things. And so I kind of knew where to put the harp within a song. And the bet, the better I got at that, the more I felt like it was like a personal thing. You know, it felt really personal, like to write a, a line that kind of stood out within a song. And, um, so yeah, I guess around, that was like around 2006 or something. And you moved out here to L.A. a couple years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like two and a half years ago. And shortly after you moved out here, we became friends, and mm-hmm. we've worked on a few projects together now. You played all the harp on Russian Doll, which I scored, and, and you played on my new album, mm-hmm. which I'm really excited <laughs> about, Woo-hoo! and some other things. Mm-hmm. But... One of the things that I admire about you, aside from what you just described, like I I think you're fantastic at coming up with parts in the moment. Thanks, Joe. uh, Or playing things, if I've kind of written it out, note for now, just nailing it. But aside from that, you know, earlier you mentioned that your mom taught you the value of hustling early Mm -hmm. on. (laughs) And I think you're one of the hustlingest hustlers (laughs) I've ever come across. Really? And it's really admirable to, to kind of observe it's it's really inspiring to observe your dedication to not only playing with scores of other musicians but leading your own you know improv duos and trios and groups and then doing solo stuff it seems like you're always on the road and always busy i mean how many projects are you a part of right now oh right now i don't know <laughs> i mean i guess they like come and go i'm doing i'm doing that project like what we talked about before with John Natchez, which is going to be really fun. It's going to be like horns and harp. And then this project with this guy, Joe DiNardo from Growing. It's guitar and harp. And then your band. Yeah. <laughs> and you just Coming did up. you just did a, a tour with Mac, mm-hmm. your old label boss yeah, from back Ma- in the day. Mac McCon doing some synth stuff. And also Meg Baird from Esper's. And here in Oblivion and her own solo stuff, she and I have a duo, and our record came out last year, and we have a couple of Midwest dates, including Milwaukee, coming up. Where are you playing in Milwaukee? Acme Records. Record store, yeah, uh-huh. that's a great store. Yeah, so that's in mid-October. Do you love being on the road? I love it. I love it, yeah. What do you love about it? I love the momentum and just feeling like, you know, making things happen and seeing beautiful places. I I really love the travel part of it, you know, just getting to see things I've never seen before and adventure. And also I love, you know, playing for people that have never really heard a harp or seen one up close or seen how it's played and like, you know, introducing people to this instrument that they might not normally get to see. And I like, I like the feeling of, um, of traveling with the harp, like, Maybe not bring it up a bunch of stairs and stuff, but you know, like the ritual of like loading it into the car after the show and all that stuff, you know, like having this giant 85 pound, like six foot tall sculptural thing that is like my companion since I was 11, you know, traveling around with it. Do you have a name for your harp? Harpy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes I fill in its bald spots with a Sharpie. (laughs) Like it's a black harp. So I have a black Sharpie that I, I cover up the little, you know, where the, the varnish is, the finish has worn away and 
you know, take the Sharpie to the harpy. <laughs> it's, really fun. it's funny, but um, I love I love a lot about being on tour. I do miss being around and hanging out with my friends, and like I like I miss a lot of dinner parties and stuff. But it's also it also feels really productive and construction constructive to be traveling while I can, you know, while I have this, like, while my human body lets me, like, travel around and... Yeah. Your human body? Yeah. It's, you know, people get older and they can't lift up an 85-pound harp into a car. So right now I can do it. So I'm You're going to have a tech by then. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> or or maybe, you'll have a, maybe you'll have a daughter who will be your <laughs> apprentice and she'll have to carry the harp around. Oh, I'm going to say wrong note, wrong note. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever taught harp? I have, yeah. I've taught harp a lot. What is your teaching style? Or a better question would be, if you were to give somebody who had never played a musical instrument a lesson for the first time, mm-hmm. what would your approach be? Oh, good question. I mean, my teaching style is pretty goofy and friendly. I would say I'm not like a rigid teacher at all. I, uh, I have, I usually just teach. I've taught a lot of small girls and older women who have retired, and that's been really fun. But teaching someone who's never played for the first time, I mean, I guess I would start with the basics, like the way that I learned, and that's kind of it's kind of boring. But you know, I'd start with just like the the C string and like learning how to open and close your hand and all that stuff. Cause I do feel like it's important. And, but then I would also, I've also tried to work in improvisation to the, to the young kids who are, who are starting with me. Like I definitely make them or have them listen to songs and like, how did this make you feel? Okay. Now, or like, Oh, that's such a great thing to do. Mm-hmm. Like describe how you feel. Like what makes this sad? What makes this a melancholy song? You know, like what makes this a happy song? Things like that, or like, you know, okay, painting a picture, like a mental picture, and then having them write a little melody based on that sort of mental, like that description of a of a scene or something, kind of like a movie, and like how in your mind, like please come up with a little song that kind of goes along with this mental image and I don't know it's fun that's awesome (laughs) how would you do it well I've done some (laughs) of those things like uh you know listen to random songs Mm -hmm. and ask how it made the kid feel the Mm -hmm. person feel and I was kind of surprised at how disconnected lots of people are from their emotions Mm. Or sometimes I'll ask, you know, what kind of music they like to listen to or what songs they've listened to a lot. And then we'll listen to that and and kind of learn that. Or I'll just have them sit behind the drums and um, play whatever they want. And then we'll turn it into an exercise, like starting Mm. with their natural inclination and then turn that into an exercise. And then, uh, yeah, you, you were talking about mental images. I also... I've had kids, once I taught a, a group of kids, they wanted to have a band. So they were middle school age boys mm-hmm. and they weren't very verbal. So I had them draw anything they wanted. And then we wrote a song about like the images that they drew. Whoa, I love <laughs> so those it. are some of the things I did. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fun to teach, isn't it? It gets your brain you know, active in a different way. That's I definitely really cool. burnt out on it after a while. Mm-hmm. It, and I feel like I, if I taught again, I would want to be more selective. Mm. Um, and, and the criterion for being selective would be that the person really wanted to be there. Yeah. I don't care about ability or aptitude as right. much as desire. And I think lots of, especially kids are forced into music because it looks good on school applications or because mm. their parents read that it would, you know, make them a well-rounded person. Right. I don't think it does unless somebody really wants to do it. Mm-hmm. But maybe a, a teacher that's better than me could help a kid fall in love with music. But for me, I, I just always loved music. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I have a harder time with people that have no connection to it, mm-hmm. that can listen to something 
like I can remember <laughs> knowing I was burnt out what I, I, there was a kid that came in and I was like, what do you like to listen to? And they were like, I don't know. And I was like, all right, fine. Let's, let's just listen to a bunch of songs and you can let me know what you like. We started with s- stuff that the kid was familiar with, like Green Day or mm. Fall Out Boy or something. And then went <laughs> to Stravinsky and John Coltrane mm-hmm. and Black Flag and, you know, just all I, fun. Dr. Dre and, mm-hmm. and Kendrick Lamar and... <laughs> Sia and uh, Madonna. Mm-hmm. And the kid was just like, I don't know, this is kind of boring. And I was uh. like, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> so just, I was like, I, I don't know. I'm, is, I, mm-hmm. is the role of a teacher supposed to be to ignite that love in somebody or yeah, to, to stoke it? <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, there has to, I kind of feel like there has to be a spark there already. Right. Or, I think the practicing part, like getting them to practice, that's, it's understandably. That's a hard part. On the other hand, I think it, it's useful to sit with somebody who thinks they can't do something and tell them, yes, you can, and you're, we're going to sit here until you can. Yeah. That's empowering for them. And then uh-huh. maybe that makes them want to practice. Totally. But I don't know. It is that thing where it's like, okay, I, I understand it completely. Like, you don't want to practice because you don't want to sound like shit, right? But then you don't, but then if you don't practice, then you sound like shit. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I started practicing at an age where I didn't know I sounded like shit. I thought mm. I sounded amazing. Okay. I mean, well, and maybe I did. I mean, <laughs> that's for, boy confidence. <laughs> was it? I don't know. I, I think it was just I loved the sound of the instrument so mm-hmm. much that I could sit there and tap a cymbal and be entranced by mm. it. And I was like, this is the most amazing feeling ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then only when I got into college did I realize I was terrible. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's funny. I don't know. But maybe because your mom was a musician, you were more in tune with your shortcomings earlier on. I, I think it's just a personality thing. Is that a boy confidence <laughs> I, thing? I think it's a confidence thing, for sure. <sighs> because <laughs> I'm a pretty self-loathing person and a self critical person Mm -hmm. were you then back then like in general not as much back then but pretty like by the time i was in high school i was Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i think it was just the one it felt like my vehicle into the world Mm -hmm. and it felt like the most special thing that i could experience at the time it's awesome and then that went away, actually. And that's why mm. part of the reason why I started the show to see if that goes away for other people and if it can come back. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, it came back when I made the record. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> but I oh, think it was. Cool. I, I think what happened is when I started to think of it more competitively, like in college, like getting ranked in school oh, and things yeah. like that, um, it took away the joy. Mm-hmm. And I became, I started to negate my own voice and my own shortcomings uh and wanted to become bulletproof like i wanted to become mm. objectively great mm-hmm. technically and and that was what i was that was my mindset like i'll become ob- objectively great at drums i'll be able to play all these different styles i'll be able to read and then i'll have the right to make a statement you know oh, wow, yeah. that was kind of my what i was thinking at the time like i don't have the right to have an opinion because my knowledge of this language is so lacking Mm -hmm. and that might not have been true Mm -hmm. you know because if we think of it as a language like what a toddler says can be just as profound as what a scholar says exactly and you can say something profound without even understanding grammar syntax or Mm -hmm. even knowing how to spell um it's so personal as long as your personal voice is like shining
Well, when I had Sheila E. on this show, when she talked into that microphone that you're talking Whoa. into, <laughs> she told me that she always, she learned early on to follow that feeling of butterflies, that mm-hmm. scary feeling that makes you want to puke. She's like, that's what I head after because I know that's where I'm going to find something incredible. Mm-hmm. And I haven't always done that. I've retreated to academia or, you know, hidden behind other people's mm. vision or not necessarily hidden, but ser- like I found, found myself servicing other people's vision. Mm-hmm. But now over the last few years, I've been going towards that scary feeling yeah. <laughs> and it's been, it's turned out really well it's awesome. for me, but this isn't about me. This is about Has you, it ever Mary. turned out? Turned out the wrong way. Well, maybe if nobody comes to my <laughs> show, <laughs> like in my my dream that I had the other night, that mm-hmm. I, I I'm announcing this show at, soon, and I, I had this dream that everybody's on stage and nobody comes <laughs> in because I forgot to tell anybody. <laughs> well, announce it far and wide. Yeah, we'll post about it. No, but okay. So turning this back towards you, <laughs> what's something scary that you want to try? Hmm. I'm, uh, usually I record my own solo records on GarageBand by myself. I've been doing it kind of like residency style. Like the last record I made at an artist residency called The Headlands outside of San Francisco. And so I had my own studio. It was like a huge space with all my instruments set up and everything. And is that the one that's in a barn? Yeah. It was in a redwood barn. It was so beautiful. That's where I recorded my conversation with brian chase for this show he did a residency there i think no way yeah that's awesome unless there's probably a few places like that outside Mm -hmm. of san francisco but i think that might have been maybe so i don't know that's awesome that's killer um i so i like to do these like residencies or self-imposed kind of residencies retreats to just like make the music on my own just to um you know get free with my own thoughts and intentions and be autonomous and stuff, but this time I'm um, this next record that I'm gonna make. I'm gonna make it with a producer, a co-producer. So I'm kind of nervous about that because I'm gonna be going over to England um, at some point early next year and gonna. Do you want to say it. who it is? Um, I don't know. Maybe I don't. Maybe okay. it'll just be a surprise. But it'll it's gonna be, be um, it's gonna be somebody that. I with someone that whose band I have really loved for years and years and years, and so inviting him to work with me on something that is so personal to me, I think I'm a little bit I'm very nervous about it, and I um, I've never really done like demos, you know, demoed songs for a record. I usually just make these concoctions like on my on my own, just like one take and then a million layers, but. Um, but this time I'm actually going to like try to write songs and sounds and like be pretty intentional about where the songs will go just because I'm going to be working with this person who doesn't want to see me just like floundering around just like, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I just want to be really thoughtful about it. Um, so yeah, that's, it's a little scary, but it's really exciting too. What was the calculus for asking someone else to come into that world with you? Just because I met this person and I was so psyched, like I was like shaking when I met this person and I was like, oh man, I can just tell, like, I don't really get so starstruck anymore. Like I, um, you got starstruck when I introduced you to somebody. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's an exception, but I, a lot of times I don't, I can really like handle it and I'm like, okay, I know how things work now. I know that everybody's just like a human being and, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it also comes from living here. I think you know, just seeing like oh stars, they're just like us. <laughs> Thing, it definitely feels like an alien world here. Sometimes we're just like everybody's just walking around like mm-hmm. in the grocery store. <laughs> I remember the first. I think it was the first day that I moved here. I ran into Steven Tyler <laughs> <laughs> at the grocery store at the no, car wash. No, it was at a. It was at a place where people like that would tend to go, but he pulled up on a green tricycle. (laughs) I'm like, all right, I'm officially living in LA now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, What do you think about the most throughout the day? 
I really like, I mean, part of why I love being on tour is that I don't have to think about, I can put aside things like, oh, I haven't gotten my car, smog, the smog check, I have to go do that, you know, like things like that, kind of like the minutia of daily life. And I can think more about like, okay, where's the, where's the weirdest place in this town I could spend a couple hours? Like, I, you know, like what's the, what's the most interesting, like, nugget I can glean of information I can glean from this like like this this place in the world you know in three hours before the sound check you know like where's the best restaurant or something like that it's always like immediate needs rather than than stuff that I probably should be thinking about back home like why do you doing mean my, should my taxes I haven't done my taxes yet stuff like that you still have a couple weeks I, until the 10th right I think oh the 10th yeah I guess a week yikes <laughs> You know, I can. I guess so. What I think about most when I'm traveling is just like food and where I should hang out and what I should check out. But when I'm home, I don't know, writing emails, stuff like that. This answer is not cool. <laughs> at all. Do you have a? Do you ever want to have a harp playing child? Oh, a child in general. Yeah. Do you I, want yeah. to? Do you want to pass down? Your mm-hmm. your harp to your child someday, or your 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 harpistry. <laughs> it's not so so pressing. Like I definitely feel really really happy right now, just seeing the world and and kind of the freedom of not having many obligations. Like I don't own a home, I don't have a boyfriend, I'm just like kind of a drifter, and I am really enjoying it right now. And I would love to have a child, but I think right now is not the right time. Mm -hmm. But if and when I do, then I think they can, um, if they gravitate towards a harp, that'll be awesome. But it's definitely not going to be anything that I make them do. But if they, if they want to try it out, definitely that would be, that would be cool. Would you ever make a record with your mom? I I would make a a record with my mom, but it would be in a different genre. I think you know it would be. We've talked about making like a holiday hits record. I don't know. It'll probably happen sometime. I think that would make her super happy. You know, it'd be like mainly for her happiness. What else do we need to talk about, Mary? Hmm. Is there anything else that you're excited about that we want Coming that up? you want to promote or I mean I could talk to you about the the thing that's been most exciting like the thing that was most exciting last week which is Harold Budd wrote me a piece mm. which he wrote the piece specifically for me and he hasn't written a piece in a really long time so I think that's pretty amazing How did that come about Um he he and I were introduced by Frosty from Dub Lab and you just casually introduced, and then um, they were putting together a a big a program of his music for Big Ears Festival in Knoxville, Tennessee, last year. And I got asked since I was playing the festival anyway. I got asked to be the harpist, and so he and I, or he, I got the music. You know, it's like, you know, actually, I don't want to be the weak link in this ensemble when I get to Na- to Knoxville. So I wrote him and I was like, is there any way I could come over to your house or wherever you are and you can just like talk me through the part? So he's like, how about you meet me at this European wine bistro place? <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, like <laughs> amazing. And so I drove out to meet him and we just got along so well that then we had dinner. We went to another place and had dinner and we just became really fast friends. And he just told me all these amazing, amazing stories and um. He's just one of the most effervescent and like very just warm people that I've ever met. And so then we played the we played the Knoxville performance and that went well. And then I kept joking with him, like, write me a piece, Harold, you know, write me a piece. Okay, sit down and write a piece. Cause he was talking about, you know, never composing ever again, blah, blah, blah. But I I thought that I could see a sparkle in his eye when I would just kind of you know, encourage him to write a piece for me because one of his first pieces, if not his first, was writing for Susie Allen, Susan Allen, who is a an amazing harpist. You know, long long ago, and he they dated, and so I was like, write me a piece, Harold. And then 
maybe a week and a half ago or two weeks, I get an email from him and it, all it says is like, it's done. Your piece is done. <laughs> I'm like, what? He actually did write me a piece. So I met him and I got the music and I'm super excited about it. When's the premiere? I don't know. It's, it has to happen. Um, I've been talking to someone about it, but we also have to record it. I just think he's such a treasure and he should really be celebrated. So hopefully the premiere of this piece will be a really great time. I should try to record an interview with him and then we can put it out right around the premiere. What if you did? Yeah, that Joe, would be great. You, he, this would be fucking awesome. Like he's so, such an interesting person to talk to. Mm-hmm. He like, you know, he remembers so much, like so many cool stories and yeah. Do it. Well, I think someday a, a young musician is going to be begging you to write a piece for him or her. <laughs> and, um, I'm so inspired uh, watching your trajectory, and I'm so glad to be friends and collaborators. And Mary Lattimore, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Joe. I love being friends with you, too. And hello to Chris Wilson, who introduced us, (laughs) too. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. (laughs) Thanks, Joe. Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Hey!